nuclear hot seat. What are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb. Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we'll be hearing from Dr. Janet Sherman, On the recent study, she wrote, along with Joseph Mangano of Radiation and Public Health Project, on birth defects in North America's West Coast infants in the months following Fukushima. Kimberly Roberson of Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network checks in with us about Becquerel Awareness Day and the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And with tomorrow being April Fool's Day, I will be sharing an audio montage of a year in the life of nuclear hot seat bloopers. And we're going to be catching up with the news, which has gotten short shrift in recent weeks with our specials on Fukushima and last week's Three Mile Island report. You will also hear our most popular feature, Numbnuts of the Week, plus activist shoutouts, the Daily Show, Okay, Trevor, you're from South Africa, which only has two nuclear reactors. Do you even understand the phrase nuclear pundit? Outreach. And more nuclear information than you'll find in any modern American history textbook. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, March 31st, 2015, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. Last week, we learned about a technology called a muon scan that gave a detailed but incomplete look at the meltdown in Unit 1 at Fukushima Daiichi. The test showed that the unit's fuel rods had melted beyond recognition, which prompted this classic understatement from Hiroshi Miyano, a visiting professor at Hosei University in Tokyo. He said, The results reaffirmed our previous understanding that a considerable amount of fuel had melted inside the nuclear pressure vessels, but there has been no evidence that the fuel has melted through the nuclear containment buildings and reached the outer environment. Okay, Professor Miyano? Where is the fuel? And how much of it got blasted up into the atmosphere when the explosion happened at Unit 3? And how much of it migrated across the Pacific in the plume that began hitting the United States as early as eight days after the accident began? Oh, that's right. The scan did not look at the bottom part of the reactor, where the molten fuel would have pooled. So some experts suggested that it was not possible to tell whether the fuel had indeed been contained. (whistles) Here, Corium. Here, Corium. Where the Dickens has that melted fuel that Corium gotten to? Miano went on to say, Eventually, TEPCO is aiming to scoop out the melted fuel little by little, rather than burying it in concrete as was done at Chernobyl in the former Soviet Union. Of course, the technology to be able to go into all that radiation and withstand it enough to still function has not yet been invented. Just a little detail. And that corium is not going to scoop out like ice cream. And even if they get it in a scoop, if it drops anywhere along the way, you've just got more spreading radiation. Ah, TEPCO, such an epitome of incompetence. Now the Associated Press has reported that no one knows where the molten fuel debris lies and in what shape or state. While TEPCO has said it likely sank to the bottom of the plant, the fuel could have dropped even beyond. Even the official in charge of the Muon project at Toshiba acknowledged that the technology will not be able to get the complete image towards the bottom of the reactor. 
A sobering picture comes from Harry Tuomisto, senior nuclear safety officer at Finland's Forum Power in 2012. He reported, When this massive amount of corium enters into the containment zone, there are very, very many different energetic consequences. Interaction of molten core and concrete starts. Concrete is eroding, and this erosion of concrete for a long time, it was known as China syndrome. Molten corium on the containment floor, it's eroding the concrete and going partially downward. The final size of the pooling maximum case is 10 to 15 meters in diameter and 6 to 7 meters, 22 to 23 feet, or the equivalent of a two-story building deep or even deeper. Two stories deep, 33 to 49 feet across. Scoop, scoop, scoop. Ah, oh, sorry, darn, didn't mean to drop it. According to the Times of London, the chief of the Fukushima nuclear power station has admitted that the technology needed to decommission three melted-down reactors does not exist, and he has no idea how it will be developed. Akira Ono conceded that the stated goal of decommissioning the facility by 2051 may be impossible. No, Mr. Ono, what's impossible is decommissioning something that is a total wreck and a disaster site. You can only decommission that which is commissioned, which is working, and this isn't. Mr. Ono went on to say, for removal of the debris, we don't have accurate information about the state of the reactors or any viable methodology. And the title of this article was Japan Faces 200-Year Wait for Fukushima Cleanup. Given that the half-life of plutonium is 24,000 years, that's not even close. The bad news just keeps coming out of Fukushima. TEPCO says that two iron gates that keep cooling water inside a spent fuel pool were found to be out of position. Now, officials say this could affect the removal of debris, but a bigger problem is that if the gates are damaged, it might trigger a water leak from the pool. And if the water leaks out of the pool, those fuel rods, which aren't as spent as we would like them to be, can overheat and make a horrific problem at Fukushima Daiichi even worse. Nuclear engineer Chris Harris spoke to Informable and identified these gates as the weakest link, which may initiate a spent fuel pool drain down. He said that the gate is a long rectangular dam in the side of the fuel pool that has seals so that it doesn't drain into the cavity and dangerously expose fuel assemblies. If the seal were to fail, then the fuel pool would drain to dangerously low levels right through the damaged gate. TAPCO, of course, always looks on the bright side and says it does not appear to be leaking. Oi. As regards radiation, a government model shows that Fukushima radioactive gas near Tokyo skyrocketed in the immediate aftermath of the Fukushima Daiichi disaster to 10 billion times normal levels. Very high concentrations were then recorded at all monitoring posts in the Northern Hemisphere. This according to the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration model. The head of Radio Analytical Laboratory at Helmholtz Zentrum München, a research institute founded jointly by Germany's Federal Ministry of Education and Research and Bavaria's Finance Ministry, reports that plutonium from Fukushima was nearly 70,000 times more than what was released in atomic bomb fallout in Japan after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Due to their long half-lives, plutonium isotopes are present in the biosphere on large timescales, and buildup can be expected in the human body. It poses a considerable hazard to human health. Therefore, it is important to study the contamination pathway of plutonium into the drinking water. The report from this research institute went on, More samples from different locations can be taken, which is essential 
when searching for locally increased plutonium concentrations in the Pacific Ocean after the Fukushima accident. Samples from different locations in the Pacific Ocean and from the snow hydrosphere are planned. Note that the willingness to even look at this information is coming out of Germany, not Japan. But TEPCO did report last week to the Japanese Nuclear Regulatory Authority that 2 trillion 200 billion becquerels of all radioactive nuclides, including strontium-90, leaked from the Fukushima facility area into the plant port in the most recent 314 days, from the 16th of April of 2014 to the 23rd of February in 2015. Regarding tritium, which is a separate measurement, that was 4,800,000,000 becquerels that leaked into the port. Again, this is coming from TEPCO. These nuclides are contained in groundwater from the plant area, and TEPCO cannot complete building the underground wall to separate the land and the port because the wall would cause underground water to back up and overflow into the plant area. Notice that nobody's talking about the popsicle fence, the frozen fence, which that was a bad idea from the get-go and it never could have worked. Then TEPCO snuck in that approximately 10% of the same amounts directly flowed into the Pacific outside of the plant port. So if you crunch the numbers, that's 480 billion becquerels of tritium and 220 billion becquerels of all other combined radionuclides. So, of course, with ugly numbers like these staring TEPCO in the face, they crank out Dale Klein, a former head of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission and now chairman of Tokyo Electric Power Company's Nuclear Reform Monitoring Committee and industry shill, though that doesn't appear on his nameplate. At a news conference in Tokyo, Klein said, Tritium can be released safely into the ocean. We know worldwide what the safe limit for tritium release is. Klein, the safe limit for tritium release is zero. Zero. At the press conference, Klein spoke about the fact that TEPCO has been treating water stored at the plant with a system known as ALPS, which stands for Advanced Liquid Processing System and stated that it removes all radioactive materials except for tritium. No, it can only remove 67 isotopes, and more than 1,200 were released at Fukushima. But be that as it may, yes, it's true, it does not take tritium out of the water. They're talking about diluting the tritium down so it isn't a problem. But radiation and radionuclides do not water down into weakness as, say, a poison or a toxin would. One neutron coming off one atom and penetrating one cell is all that it takes for damage to be done. So there's no way to make this stuff safe. So don't release it into the Pacific. You've done enough to muck it up already. And by the way, Dale Klein is no prize. Before he was with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, he was the executive director for the Nuclear Weapons Council at the Department of Defense, which is the body that makes decisions about U.S. nuclear weapons development, military requirements, and related issues. Moving away from the purely technical side of what's going on at Fukushima, Pope Francis warned against the dangers of arrogance when he compared Fukushima's nuclear crisis to the biblical Tower of Babel in a talk held with Japanese bishops in the Vatican. The Pope said, Mankind can become arrogant and create a society convenient to them, driven by an egotistical motive. Ya think? He went on to say, Acts thought to help mankind are ending up destroying themselves. The Pope also warned that the production and export of arms is the most destructive threat to civilization, stating that the problem lies in how massive wealth is created through them. This is a Pope who understands. 
At Tokyo Sea Life Park, last November there were 69 bluefin tuna in their main tank. The next month, December, the fish started dying at an alarming rate. In January, only 11 remained, and now there is only one bluefish tuna left in all of Tokyo Sea Park. The fish are on the verge of extinction, and ironically, the Tokyo Aquarium is known for a breeding program intended to save the species. Researchers are considering numerous factors, such as nutrition, changes in the physical environment, including light, sound, and vibration. They are monitoring water quality, oxygen levels, searching for possible poisonous substances such as heavy metal. A spokesperson for the aquarium, Satoshi Tada, said, We are studying what caused the fish deaths, but we haven't figured it out yet. We suspect that it could be due to new factors that were not present before. Interestingly, nobody once bothered to point out that the Tokyo Sea Park is only 295 kilometers or 183 miles south of Fukushima Daiichi. Talk about the elephant in the aquarium. A major highway connecting Tokyo to the coastal Tohoku region has opened with the completion of the final stretch that runs past the wreckage of the Fukushima nuclear power plant. Local governments and tourism officials are pinning their hopes that it will bolster tourism. Along one eight-kilometer or five-mile stretch of the Joban Expressway, Radiation levels are high enough that residents are not permitted to return to their homes for the foreseeable future. At one point, the expressway comes within six kilometers or three and three quarter miles of the Fukushima nuclear disaster site. It took four years to complete work on this final section because radioactive fallout hampered construction work. My only question is did the contractors use Eco cement in building this extension, something which incorporates within it the ash from incineration of the decontamination debris. Just curious. And as if all this isn't crazy enough. Nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none that's not a week. By now, we all know that. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe baby lied to the International Olympic Committee when he told them that the contaminated water problem at Fukushima was under control and was entirely blocked within the area of the Fukushima nuclear plant. But what you might not be aware of is that in March of 2014, in the House of Councilors in Japan, Abe stated that there was an international political atmosphere that if Japan was not capable of settling contaminated water problems, it should not be allowed to host the 2020 Olympics. That sounds sane and reasonable, doesn't it? So to counteract that, Abe said that he saw it as his responsibility to remove such an atmosphere by saying the situation is under control. However, to him, that does not mean any more to him than he was in charge of reviewing the contaminated water situation. That's right. There is no problem if you close your eyes and put your fingers in your ears and go, la, 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 it's okay, now give us those Olympics. Oh, why don't you just define what the word is, is. Your job, Abe, was to tell the truth to the world's premier athletes so that they would not be subjected to the kind of radiation that you are seeking to subject them to. This is evil numbnuts of the most evil type, lying for commercial gain while putting the future health and wellness of the best and brightest physical specimens on earth at risk. And that is why Shinzo Abe, in your black-hearted soul, you are now and forever nuclear hot seed, numbnuts of the week. Numbnuts of the millennium, you mean. And by the way, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, baby, of the Tokyo 2020 Olympics, 
will embark on a week-long U.S. tour in April. This is going to mark the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. In addition to talks in Washington, Abe will tour Boston, San Francisco, and Los Angeles during the April 26th through May 3rd trip. He'll be in D.C. April 27th to 30th, and no word on the dates or locations in the other cities. But mark your calendars. Let's see if we can have some fun. And two good pieces of information out of Japan. Five aging nuclear reactors in Japan are going to be permanently decommissioned. And Minamisoma City in Fukushima Prefecture is going to have official anti-nuclear PR. Yes! In three, count them, three locations around town. There will be signs, hopefully billboards, saying denuclearized municipality. It sounds snappier in Japanese. That's right. Three billboards versus millions in government-supported nuclear cover-up propaganda. Well, it's a start. Phew! That catches us up on Japan. Over to the U.S., where in a totally tone-deaf move, President Barack Obama has issued an executive order on federal sustainability that states that clean energy sources must make up at least 25% of the energy consumed by U.S. federal agencies by 2025. Unfortunately, he includes in the list of alternative energy sources small modular nuclear reactors. That's right. SMR technologies are put on equal footing alongside biomass, solar, thermal, geothermal, waste heat, and renewable combined heat and power processes. So what are small modular reactors and alternative to? Sanity? Lots going on at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP, site in Carlsbad, New Mexico. That's where, on Valentine's Day of 2014, a 55-gallon drum of plutonium-contaminated nuclear waste went bloop, and the top came off, and radiation was released, and americium and plutonium were released into the environment, as well as the entire underground of the WIP site being contaminated, and thus shut down. Well, organic kitty litter is taking the fall for this one because the official report has come out and said that the entire accident was caused by chemically incompatible contents, including kitty litter, that reacted inside a barrel of waste from Los Alamos National Laboratory that caused a reaction inside a barrel and caused it to rupture. If the brainiacs at Los Alamos or WIP had bothered to check the list of ingredients on the kitty litter, they would have seen that it did not contain clay, which is what neutralized the waste in the past. Like I said, kitty litter and Los Alamos are taking the fall, but that doesn't get whip off the hook for not having the HEPA filters in their ventilation system kick in until more than 30 minutes after the accident, which is what allowed the release of plutonium and americium into the general environment and led to the contamination of 22 workers, all of whom have tested positive for internal contamination by radionuclides. Of course, the contractor that operates the site, Nuclear Waste Partnership, maintains that the radiation is in such low amounts that it is, quote, not expected to threaten their health. Apparently, no one has bothered to explain to them or to the workers the difference between external and internal contamination by radiation. It's the difference between warming your hands on a nice bonfire and swallowing a hot coal. So WIP is expected to cost at least $240 million to clean up. And now the state of New Mexico has levied a $54 million fine against the U.S. for violations at the nuclear repository. Last Thursday... Energy Secretary Moniz acknowledged during a congressional hearing that the timetable and budget for getting WIP back on track was a little bit uncertain. The recovery plan calls for full operations by 2018. Yuck, yuck, yuck. Ain't going to happen. 
you can quote me. And officials have estimated it could take more than half a billion dollars to do it. Even if it happens, watchdog Don Hancock of Southwest Research and Information Center and one of Nuclear Hot Seat's most reliable sources for information on all things WIP said that the repository doesn't have enough room for the waste already in the waiting line. In California, a state legislator wants the California Public Utilities Commission to investigate how it reached a $4.7 billion settlement on shutting down the San Onofre nuclear power facility. The agreement requires electricity customers to cover $3.3 billion of the cost. Southern California Edison and San Diego Gas and Electric are on the hook for the remaining $1.4 billion, which is nothing. It's been revealed that the framework for the agreement was developed during a secret meeting in Poland two years ago between former PUC President Michael Peavy and an executive from San Onofre Majority Owner Southern California Edison. Officials from the PUC and utility executives are the target of state and federal investigations. The Union of Concerned Scientists' top nuclear expert, says the forced reactor shutdown at Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station in Massachusetts during the January 27 blizzard was risky enough to make his organization's annual near-miss list. David Lockbaum, director of the organization's nuclear safety project, said Pilgrim wasn't near meltdown, but the multitude of mechanical difficulties that occurred after off-site power to the plant was partially lost are cause for concern. Lockbaum said about Pilgrim, there are many, many steps before a core meltdown, but they took a few steps down that road. In a perfect world, you don't want to go down that path at all. The nation's oldest nuclear power plant at Oyster Creek has shut down because of an issue with one of its steam pressure systems. The plant, located in Ocean County, New Jersey, only 87 miles from New York City, is scheduled to shut down permanently in 2019 because officials said it would be too expensive for them to build a required cooling tower. Oyster Creek is a member of the infamous Fukushima Factor Times 23 gang, the 23 nuclear reactors in the United States that have the same General Electric Mark I boiling water reactor design that was used in Fukushima. You know, four more years of risk. Guys, keep it shut down. Shoot it. Put it out of its misery. And us too. In Taiwan, more than 283 Japanese food products imported from the radiation-stricken areas near the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster were found to be relabeled as having come from other areas of Japan and sold to local customers in Taipei, Taiwan. Officials from New Taipei City's Department of Health, as well as the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and other law enforcement authorities, seized the mislabeled products, although a substantial portion had already been sold to consumers. Nineteen products originated from areas exposed to radiation. In 2011, Taiwan banned the sale of all foods from Fukushima and four other prefectures, and that ban is still in place today. The import companies involved have been ordered to inform downstream sellers to cease the sale of said products within a week. Couldn't you do it a little bit faster, guys? The food ranged from noodles and soy sauce to biscuits and chocolate. And now, as of March 27th, the lone person taking the fall for this one is a Food and Drug Administration official at a customs office in Keelung. What would you poor schmuck translate to in Taiwan? In Hong Kong, a former environmental protection official has revealed what she labels astounding levels of background radiation in some of Hong Kong's poorly ventilated urban areas, as much as 36% higher than the global average. Dr. Mamie Lau Mei Ming said that while the levels were not considered life-threatening, constant exposure in small doses could have cumulative effects, 
and cell membranes are damaged much more readily by long-term exposure to low-level radiation than brief exposure to the same dose. And the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Yukia Amano, speaking at the Nuclear Africa 2015 conference in South Africa, said that supporting Africa is a high priority for the IAEA. Well, of course, it's a high priority. That's because there are only two reactors on the entire continent, both in South Africa. Leaving all that land, you can still muck up. Are you listening, Trevor Noah? We'll have our interviews in just a moment, but first, the Uranium Film Festival in Quebec is in mid-April. That's uranium, not Iranian. I've gotten into that trouble with some people. Anyway, it's going to be an ingathering of 42 films from around the world dealing with nuclear issues. And while I am not yet fully funded, I have taken the leap of faith and booked my plane ticket to attend. My gratitude to those of you from Nuclear Hot Seat who have donated to help me get there as a combination of what you have provided plus the matching grant I was offered, have allowed me to take this important first step. I look forward to bringing you all the news from filmmaker activists around the world. And now I've learned that I'm going to be able to attend and cover the first two days of the World Uranium Symposium, which is taking place at the exact same time. This is an in-gathering of some of our most powerful speakers, including Dr. Helen Caldicott, Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Energy Education, Linda Gunter of Beyond Nuclear, Sierra Club Southwest activist Leona Morgan, and Saskatchewan First Nations activist Susnige Nene and Candice Paul, along with Angela Bischoff of the Ontario Clean Air Alliance. All that plus 42 films. I won't be able to see them all, but I'll see as many as I can. Look, if you are against nuclear, There is no better place to be between April 14 and 25 than Quebec. So if you can't get there, as a Nuclear Hot Seat listener, the next best thing will be you getting to hear me give you up close and personal with all the action, what the activists have to say, what the presenters have to say, some of the actions we'd want to take, even a little bit of nuclear humor if we can get around to that. I will do the same thing with this event that I did with Dr. Caldicott's symposium a month ago and last week's anniversary report on Three Mile Island. You will feel the pulse, the excitement, the sense of activists genuinely linking from around the world as we reinforce ourselves and each other in our belief and our actions to shut down nukes forever. Now, like I said, I've got my plane ticket. But I'm still going to have to pay half of the housing, all of my meals, plus ground transportation. So I still need your help if I'm going to get up there and do this job for you. You can help by donating any amount. Nothing is too small. I'm grateful for it all because it represents energy and belief and positivism and the sense that we are going to get this done. To donate, go to NuclearHotSeat.com. On the homepage, scroll down just a bit and click on the big red donate button. Once you get inside, the credit card donation button now works. Thank you, PayPal, for messing that one up for a couple of weeks. So even if you don't have a PayPal account, you can still donate. And if you want to do it the old-fashioned way, let me know. I'll send you an address. You can send a check. It will all work out. So if you're moved to support yourself in understanding the issues, and want to support me in my efforts to get this information to you, please go to NuclearHotSeat.com, donate what you can, and know that whatever it is, you have got my gratitude. One of the stories that hit last week was about the publication of a new study by Joseph Mangano and Dr. Janet Sherman of Radiation and Public Health Project. The official title is Changes in Congenital Anomaly Incidents in West Coast and Pacific States, USA, After Arrival of Fukushima Fallout. In plain language, it's a study of the birth defects in children born in the first eight months of 2011 on the West Coast of North America. 
radioactive fallout after the March 11 Fukushima nuclear meltdown entered the U.S. environment within days. Levels of radioactivity were particularly elevated in the western states bordering on the Pacific Ocean. The report compares rates of five congenital anomalies between 2010 and 2011 births between the months of April and November. It showed an increase of 13% in the western states, which is significantly greater than the 3.77% decrease for all other U.S. states combined. So what does this mean in common language? That's why I spoke with Dr. Janet Sherman, co-author of this report. She is a medical doctor who specializes in internal medicine and toxicology with an emphasis on chemicals and nuclear radiation that causes illness, including cancer and birth defects. Dr. Sherman is well known for her work with statistician Joseph Mangano on analyses of data after Fukushima that indicate a spike in U.S. infant mortality and hypothyroidism. She also edited the English translation of Alexei Yablokov's groundbreaking work on the book Chernobyl, Consequences of the Catastrophe for People and the Environment. I spoke with Dr. Sherman last week to get further information about this latest study. Dr. Janet Sherman, welcome back to Nuclear Hot Seat. Well, it's an honor to to speak with you again. Thank you. Janet, Radiation and Public Health Project has previously published studies regarding an increase in thyroid damage and birth defects to children born on the west coast of North America after Fukushima. What are the medical aspects that those earlier studies focused on? Well, they focused on the exposure of the unborn, in other words, the fetus and the infant while it's still in the mother. The exposures occur by way of the mother's diet and the water she drinks, and these cause damage to the baby before that baby is born. What kinds of changes did you spot at that time from before the date that Fukushima happened and in the, I believe it was nine months immediately after? Well, we found more problems with thyroid disease in babies. And of course, the thyroid is, begins very early development in the fetus. And the incidence was higher on babies born on the West Coast than ones born through the rest of the United States. So these are concerns about damage in utero. And what was the implication as regards Fukushima in the increase in the number of babies and the percentage of babies who were showing these anomalies in the thyroid? Well, it indicates that they were exposed while they were still in their mother's womb to radioisotope, particularly iodine, which is picked up and transported to the thyroid of the unborn. The radiation from Fukushima reached the United States, and the greatest fallout was on the West Coast states. So these were two earlier studies that were done. Now there is a new one that has been released. What makes this latest study different? We looked at birth defects in newborns, and we chose the West Coast compared to the rest of the United States. We did not look at birth defects such as heart defects because these are not necessarily obvious when a child is born. So we looked at specific birth defects that can't be confused with anything else, and this included anencephaly, which means lack of a a full brain, which is obvious when a child is born with that. We looked at trisomy 21, which is also known as Down syndrome, and there's no mistaking a baby born with that. We also looked at cleft lip and cleft palate, and there's no mistaking what those are. And the last two was failure of the tissues over the spine to fully close or the tissues over the stomach and intestines to fully close. So these are unusual, and they can't be confused with something else. 
And we did find that there was an increase since Fukushima. If you can speak to the number or the percentage, what was the increase and what is the significance of the increase? Well, it was not a large increase, and I'd have to look at the paper to tell you the exact number, but compared to babies born in the rest of the country, there was an increase along the West Coast. When and where was this latest study published? This was published online in the Open Journal of Pediatrics, 2015, that is this uh, last two weeks, on pages 76 through 89, and there is a website on radiation and public health and on my own website where you can access the entire article. And my website is www.janetsherman, J-A-N-E-T-T-E, sherman.com. And the radiation and public health one is www.rphp.org. And, of course, we will link to the article and to these two websites on this week's episode, number 197. What has been the reception, if any, in the medical world since this has been published? Well, the first one got quite a lot of press and uh, questions and people who responded to it. But very few people have responded to this one, the congenital anomalies. You have to understand it's extremely difficult in the United States to get articles like this into the popular press. Largely, the big newspapers don't want to touch it. And largely, the nuclear industry is able to keep these articles out of the popular press. So what you're saying is that there hasn't been much response to it, at least so far. That's correct. What are the implications for women who live on the West Coast who wish to get pregnant, and what is the implication for their babies? Does there need to be concern? Is there any kind of detoxification they could be doing? Is there anything that can be done? As far as I know, there is nothing that can be done, except that, uh, you know, this puts it on the mother, the father, and the family. But we need adequate testing of fruits and vegetables and fish and meat and milk. And this is by the government with full access to the results in a timely manner. And this is not being done. Most people haven't a clue as to what levels of radiation are in their neighborhoods. For those women who have given birth to children or there has been a miscarriage of a child that shows one of these birth defects, is this a sign that the woman has suffered genetic damage and will this persist in future pregnancies? It's not an indication of genetic damage to the mother, and it may not persist into the next pregnancy because these are teratogens. These affect the fetus. So if a mother has had one of these catastrophes, I would call it, she, uh, I was going to try, what can, what can she do? Not much of anything except Try to be part of the voices that are calling for testing of food, particularly dairy products, and the publication in a timely manner of the results. Now, the time frame that you focused on for this report was in the months immediately after Fukushima happened. We are now four years after the accident began. And yes, there are continuing radiation releases into the water. There is contamination happening from the burning of debris, the so-called decontamination debris in Japan that's re-releasing the radionuclides into the air. So there are many other sources of contamination. Is there a continuing and ongoing problem for women on the West Coast who are seeking to get pregnant and give birth to a healthy child? I believe there is, and we we know, for instance, that uh, sea animals have been dying along the coast. I don't know if anybody has tested them. I have friends and colleagues in Alaska who fish, and they would like to know what the levels of radiation are in the fish that they're catching. So we really don't know. I mean, the dearth of testing in the United States is not good. 
So in other words, we have no idea how ongoing this threat is and whether if perhaps it has decreased or increased in the time since the Fukushima accident began. I doubt very much that it has decreased because we they have not been able to contain those reactors. One of the emails I got today is that reactor number one, all the fuel rods melted down are in, in the bottom of the reactor. Now, no human can go near that because the radiation is so high, but by remote sensing and uh, they have discovered that all of this radiation is in the bottom of the reactor. Now, nobody can go in there to get it out, so it has to be taken out remotely. And this will take probably decades before anything can be done with it. We also know there's tremendous amount of water stored along the coast by Fukushima, and they can't contain it, and it is leaking into the ocean. So any chance of this stopping it's pretty slim. Anything you'd like to add? The thing I would like to add is I hope people in the United States understand that it really is impossible to build a nuclear reactor and not have something go wrong with it. And if something goes wrong with a nuclear reactor, it's the people who live downwind of that reactor who are most affected. And we need to close reactors as quickly as possible, many of them are 30 to 40 years old, and their chances of breaking down are increased. So I hope that your audience will participate in getting public voices out to close these nuclear reactors. The listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat are really good about it. They are some of the most engaged people on the face of the planet. And as the listenership continues to grow internationally, I know that people are getting educated and motivated to do everything they can to turn this nuclear juggernaut around and see what, if anything, can be done to protect us from the damage that has already been done. Well, I thank you for all your efforts and all your good work and your membership, and we need you very, very much. That was Dr. Janet Sherman. Links to the websites where you can find the full report will be on the website nuclearhotseat.com under this episode, number 197. I also had a chance to catch up last week with one of Nuclear Hot Seat's favorites, Kimberly Roberson, the founder of Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network. Kimberly wants to make you aware of two important issues and what you can do to participate in making a difference. Hi, this is Kim Roberson, the director of Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network, otherwise known as FAN inviting you to participate in our upcoming second annual Becquerel Awareness Day. As many of you know, a Becquerel is a unit of measurement representing one atomic disintegration per second. The devastated Fukushima Daiichi nuclear reactors have leaked and are continuing to leak trillions of Becquerels of radionuclides into the Pacific Ocean and biosphere with no end in sight. The Trans-Pacific Partnership, otherwise known as TPP, is a classified secret trade agreement that could allow more radioactive food from Japan to enter the U.S. Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon will decide whether to fast-track the TPP, and his decision will happen possibly in mid-April. President Obama has been pressuring Wyden to okay fast-track, so he needs to hear from us about Fukushima and the FDA's abysmal policy of fostering the highest allowable levels of radiation in food in the world here in the United States, 12 times higher than Japan, which means that food from Japan deemed unfit for consumption there can legally be sold to U.S. consumers. Men, women, pregnant women, children, infants, the elderly are all susceptible and at risk. Beginning April 1st, FAN is rallying people around the U.S. to call Senator Wyden's offices and President Obama to demand the end once and for all a fast track. The final day of this action is April 10th, which is also Becquerel Awareness Day. Then, on April 11th, FAN will host a teleconference event as part of our continuing education series on Fukushima's radioactive impact on the U.S. food supply. 
Speakers at that event will include leaders from all three groups that filed Van's citizen petition to FDA, a non-adversarial legal document demanding better and more transparent monitoring of food in the U.S. for radiation. Also, a speaker will be on hand to give an update on the TPP fast track process. Defeat of fast track essentially means a defeat of the TPP. So please mark your calendars for these events. More information at www.ffan.us. Thank you. Kimberly Roberson of Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network at ffan.us. We'll hear more from Kimberly about the Trans-Pacific Partnership and how it impacts those of us in the anti-nuclear community on next week's program. Well, John Stewart's gone and done it. He's named his successor, and he's going to be followed by Trevor Noah, late of South Africa, who's going to be the next host of The Daily Show. Now, South Africa has only two nuclear reactors, so Trevor... I know what it's going to take to bring you up to speed on the nuke situation in the U.S., a nuclear pundit. Someone to keep you aware of this internationally tricked out deadly technology. So look, Booby. I don't know. Do you say Booby to people from South Africa? Anyway, Trevor, I'll send you a packet of information and then call for us to have a chance to talk with each other. I'm certain you'll be able to make time in your busy schedule, despite the current media crush around you. After all, this is Nuclear Hot Seat. Oh, and just a word to the wise, leave that tweet deck alone. Activist shout out. The activists are linking, as the hard-to-understand line in the Nuclear Hot Seat theme song states. And it really is happening. Kudos to Kumar Sundaram of India on his recent trip to Japan, where he met up with activists and got to deliver information about why allowing Japan to sell nuclear technology to India is wrong for both countries for a multitude of reasons. In Quebec, besides covering both the Uranium Film Festival and the World Uranium Symposium, I'm looking forward to finally getting a chance to meet and hug in real-life person Susnage Nene, Candace Paul, Angela Bischoff, and the other activists whose paths I've crossed so many times on Twitter or in email in the four years since Fukushima began. And gratitude continues to Myla Reason, whose brand is a short video by Myla Reason. And her short videos really pack a punch. She dug up a speech I gave in 2012 at the Japan Consulate in Los Angeles against restarting the nuclear reactors at OE and posted it to YouTube. Then she did a great takedown piece on Patrick Moore. This is the guy who claims to be a founder or co-founder of Greenpeace. He's not. He may have been involved with the group back then, but he has way exaggerated his role. And now that's made him an all-purpose shill whenever nukers or Monsanto or pro-tar sands or anti-renewable, anti-environment corporations want to hire a quote-unquote environmentalist who espouses their views to the media. He is most recently famous for saying on a TV program that Monsanto's Roundup Weed Killer is quote, perfectly safe to drink by the court. So the host of the show he was on said that he had the stuff backstage and offered him a quart to drink. And that's when Moore walked off the program, huffing, I am not an idiot. Yuck, 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 let's put that one up for a vote. Anyway, Milo put together a great video mashup of More is Less. It includes part of the speech that I gave three years ago, as well as a lot of other footage. And it's gotten him so mad he's actually posting with a cute little sugar plum fairy of an avatar talking about how what he's saying is right and all the rest of us is wrong. It's really quite funny. Go check it out on Myla's YouTube channel. Myla, M-Y-L-A, Reason, R-E-S-O-N. Here's today's final thought. Tomorrow is April Fool's Day. And just to keep things in perspective, I've compiled a few of the unheard highlights of Nuclear Hot Seat. It's a blooper reel of sorts. Every week, I edit the show before you get a chance to hear it. 
So here is just a brief glimpse of some of what gets edited out on the way to providing you with each week's show. I, I mean, I, 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 that still, that, those, you know, this, uh, it was, it was investigative. But recently, <clears throat> John Rocco of Phys- as two nuclear hot seat listeners and supporters, what was it like to be here at your first ever? Don't oh, wait. Let me talk into the right end of it. <laughs> okay. This is how tired I am. Oh no. Mm. I hate this story. I hate this story. I hate this story. Um. Um. Uh. Um. What progress, if any, has? No, let me try that again. Albuquerque, June. Buh, buh, buh. There's a dog barking. Let me close the door. It's not even my dog. Hey. Hey! Knock it off! Knock it off! Let me throw some kibble out. I throw it over the fence. It eats it. And it shuts up. <laughs> <laughs> what goes on behind the scenes? You know, I mean, the <laughs> stuff that I... Then there's the issue of my name. Always good for a laugh or two. We will, Libby, and also... You want to put a B in your name? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Research. Take, take Look, Whatever. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, October twenty second, twenty thirteen. Is that today's day? <clears throat> we will live a, and also, if well, people who again, live in that, it, it's Lee B. It's like a B named Lee. 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 Lee B. I'm writing it down. Lee Thank you. Lee and it's Lee. Okay. There you go. Um, uh, it's just, uh, it's, it's. Um, 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 so. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Wednesday, October 20th. Tuesday. Tuesday. Of, of, of. And that may not end up in the interview at all. So. <laughs> See, I get to edit out the parts where I sound stupid, so I always sound smart. Um, <laughs> okay. Not that I think I really fooled any of you, but I hope that gave you a smile. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, March 31st, 2015. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from ENENews.com, AP, the International Atomic Energy Agency, Kyoto, Japan Times, NHK, and Formable, the Times of London, Fukushima Diary and Our Friend Iori Mochizuki, France's IRSN, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, Helmholtz Radio Analytical Lab, WashingtonPost.com, Asahi, Gigi, AFP France, Santa Fe, New Mexican, Santa Cruz Sentinel, KPBS.org, CapeCodOnline.com, CorporateCrimeReporter.com, ChinaPost.com, TaiwanNews.com, FukuLeaks.org, SCMP.com, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, TEPCO, the Directionless Desk Drones at World Nuclear News, and all the lovely, smart, attractive, and good karma folks in the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community, which you are all invited to join. Theme music written by me, sung by Mary Lee Weaver. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on AirProgressive.com. Our archive is available on our website, or you can search it out on iTunes where you can subscribe under podcasts. Our YouTube channel also carries the show under Nuclear Hot Seat videos. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2015, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed, as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat.